tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, apathy. So you better care about this sermon. Um, now, I was thinking about this. Uh, my wife's going to hate me here in just a minute. Uh, I was thinking about this on, uh, I'm trying to remember, I believe it was Friday. We went up to the city, and uh, during our time there in the city, we had you know, things to do and all. And at one point in our time in the city, I found myself at a store called At Home. Uh, if you have never been to At Home, uh, it is Hobby Lobby on steroids. Uh, it is like Hobby Lobby, but the size of Sam's Club or Costco or uh, the Pentagon or something like that. But it, it's a big place, and uh, a lot of times when we'll go, we'll just kind of, not a lot, I haven't been a lot of times, I guess, but uh, we'll walk up and down lots of different aisles and stuff. And as, as we were walking through there uh, with some friends and uh, we came to this thing where there was a mail organizer, uh, not, not like me, but like postage uh, organizer, and it was this thing you hang on the wall, and it's almost like a, uh, a nicer home-looking version of the file uh, boxes you'd have on your office door where you put all the files. And my wife says to me, we, we, would you like something like this to organize the mail? And I had lots of thoughts going through my head at that moment. Um, I won't even get into all of them, but uh, one of them I thought is I, I realized the reason why we need a thing to organize the mail is that we don't care about the mail. And yet we know there may be something important in there, so you don't want to throw it away. But honestly, wh what I will do, and I, I usually check the mail uh, because it's just, I, I don't know, it, it makes me feel worthwhile, I don't know. I check the mail, I bring it in, and usually I will set it on. We have this little countertop in our laundry room ready to come in the garage. And that stack will grow and grow and grow. And I, I will look through it and see who it's from and what it is. And it's usually somebody selling something or a bill that I'm already aware of or, uh, you know, some kind of flyers or maybe a magazine here and there, different things. And usually without even opening the envelope, if there is one, I already know what's inside. And I know whether it's something that, you know, we'll probably need to keep for tax purposes or whatever, uh, or just to hang on to because we, we keep things. And then some of that, some of it, honestly, I'll just look at it and immediately think, well, this can just go in the recycle bin and we're good to go. I don't care about most of what comes in the mail. Now, every now and then I have something that is the opposite of that. Uh, I got a really nice letter. I don't see Larry here tonight, but I got a really nice letter from Larry Darbison last week. And when I saw Larry Darbison on the return address, I thought, okay, I'm opening this. I I'm going to see what, and, and by the way, lest you think you can never send me mail now, if your name is on it, I will actually open it. You know, it's usually when it's some company or whatever, I just don't care. And I opened the letter and I read it, uh, uh, teared up a little bit, honestly, as I read it. And, and I thought, okay, this one, this is not going in a mail organizer. It's, it's going, I have a file in, in my office, uh, in the drawer, that if I'm ever having a bad day, which fortunately for me, I don't have tons of those, but if there's ever a day where I think to myself, what am I doing? Does this have any meaning? Why am I here? If, if anybody's upset about something, I will pull that file out, and I will just pick something at random. And sometimes it's something from here. Sometimes it's something from Eugene. Sometimes it's something from a teenager 20 years ago in Arkansas. And I will say, oh, yeah, that, that's why. I love to get letters that are meaningful. Uh, and if those came to my house, that would quickly rise to the top of the stack, and I would open it up and want to see what it's all about. And so as we think of apathy in terms of Bible study that we looked at this morning, if you got home tomorrow from work, uh, or if you're at home and you went out to the mailbox, and you opened the mailbox up, and there was a letter, and the return address was God. Okay, I don't anticipate this, by the way, but it, just hypothetically, stick with me. How quickly would you open that envelope? I mean, let, let's get past the assumptions that there's some crazy person sending you something or whatever. It may, it, it's really a letter from God. How quickly would you open it up, stop what you're doing, not get into interruptions, and read what he had to say? And I'm going to guess for us, I mean, you're, you're the Sunday night crowd. If you were to get a letter like that, you could not wait to see it. You would immediately tell your friends about it. You might uh, run down to at home and buy a nice frame to put it in and put it on your wall so you can look at it every day as you walk by. It will become incredibly important to you. And yet, you have it. I mean, you ha it was written a long time ago, but, but we have it. And how many days do we go through without it? How many days do we go through where the things in here are not all that important to us? 
I don't think we would consider ourselves to people that are apathetic about Scripture. And yet, if you were to look at it from the outside, it kind of looks that way sometimes. And we're all guilty. You know, I, I can be guilty at times in life of getting very focused in on whatever it is we're going to talk about here and forgetting, you know, that's not an, a substitute for my own Bible study. I mean, it's important and I need to do it, but as, as a minister, I can't just be about the job side of it. There's still a side of it that is, how am I going to grow spiritually? And as we talked about this morning, it begins here. So when we consider apathy, uh, Webster's definitions, and I, I don't like the first one at all, I love the second one. Uh, lack of feeling or emotion, impassiveness. Now, I get in the world sense there's some of that probably. Uh, and I also get, by the way, that in Churches of Christ, we may get accused of this because what we do here doesn't have a major outward look to it for the most part. There's not a lot of lifting hands and a lot of uh, you know outward emotional things happening during our worship. And yet my hope is that as you consider the words to the song we sang or the prayer that we that we took part in, that there is something emotional going on within you. But secondly, and I think this is where it really hits us upside the head, uh, if I can use a colloquialism, Mark, uh, it really hits us upside the head with where we are with Scripture. It's a lack of interest or concern. And if we're going to be honest with ourselves, the way we interact with Scripture on a day-to-day basis might look a little more like this than we're willing to admit. It's a lack of interest in the sense that if you are interested in something, what do you do? Uh, if you, I was just talking to somebody this morning about one of your teams is now in the SEC with my team, and they're playing in Norman next year or this year, and I thought, I'd love to run across some tickets to that somehow. Uh, if you Talk to me later. Uh, I'd love to run across tickets to that. I'm, I'm interested. It's something that's on my mind. Or there's a concern. Scripture is important enough that it should concern us to know it better. And so for us, sometimes our interaction with Scripture looks kind of like this, especially if your version of Bible study is whatever you hear from up here in the course of a week. Hopefully it's worthwhile, but there needs to be something different, uh, deeper than that. And the word that I think encompasses it so well, indifference. And indifference is just, when you're on the other side of indifference, how does it feel? You know, do you feel just not worthwhile as an individual when someone is being indifferent with you, when someone just doesn't care? Do you ever call some company for help with customer service and you reach a person on the other end of the phone that has a script that they're sticking to and they're not really listening to what you're saying and they're not trying to solve your problem and you just feel kind of frustrated and I feel indifference in those times. Have you ever been talking with someone and having a serious conversation and then notice they're looking down at their phone and you don't know if they're fully there or not and you kind of feel indifference at times? How does God feel? You know, as he looks at people that he has given better access to his word than any people in any point in history, as we talked about this morning, how does he feel when we don't take advantage of that? And I think it comes across, I would imagine to him, is indifference, which is the last thing in the world we want to be. Uh, Ely Weasel, uh, and I, I might have just butchered his name, I'm not 100% sure how to say it, he is a concentration camp survivor, Romanian Jew uh, who was in a concentration camp during World War II, and in his experiences, one of the things he took great note of was, yes, there was hate involved, but there were also these moments of indifference. And he talks about indifference this way, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it is indifference. And that is, if we're thinking of indifference in those terms, the last way we want to interact with Scripture. We want to be people that have a care, a concern, a value for Scripture that shows in the way we treat it, in the way we read it, in the way we study it. Uh, so, Tonight, we're going to look at the idea of apathy and indifference. It won't always connect directly to how we interact with Scripture, but I think it will help us to better understand what apathy looks like uh, and maybe how we could do something different when it comes to things of God and especially His Word. So what would apathy look like in the life of, the, of a Christian? And let me first say, before we get into this, it should look totally out of place. And I don't have a, a scripture for that, but I think you could look at the whole of scripture and see that. S Christians should not be apathetic people. Christians should be people that have care and concern about any number of things, the least of which, by the way, is our own opinions, which is where we tend to get stuck sometimes. 
but we should have care and concern about people and situations and all of the things of life and scripture and the things of God and who he wants us to be. It should not look normal there. But as we go through this list, I think you will see a lot of things that maybe you've struggled with at times or you definitely see Christians around you who struggle with them. So first of all, it shows itself in a lack of understanding. If you don't care about something or someone, it is very difficult to understand that thing or that person. You, you have to have some level of engagement, some level of concern to, to get who they are. So many times the disagreements we have, they, they come back down to this. If we just would listen and better understand each other, maybe the disagreements would make a little more sense. And maybe even if we didn't come to the other person's point of view, we would at least better understand why they had that point of view. Uh, in Scripture, in Acts 28, and it's interesting to me, this is a quote from Isaiah that Paul makes here in Acts 28. It's also a quote from Isaiah that Jesus makes somewhere in the later part of Matthew. And then, of course, Isaiah said it initially back in his prophecy. It's an important enough idea that it's mentioned at least three times in Scripture. He says, go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. So these are people who are engaged enough to hear and see, and yet what is going on around them doesn't make sense. Uh, if you could imagine, if you were dropped in the middle of a foreign country where you did not speak the language, and you looked around yourself and saw what was going on, maybe you could read a little bit from body language or expression or things like that, but you don't fully understand because you don't know the words that are being said. Uh, and so you're getting this kind of partial view. Verse 27, he says, For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. These are a people who hear God and, and see the things that he has done, and yet they are not going to the next level of trying to understand. And that lack of understanding is causing this, this separation between them and God. Uh, uh, secondly, if you are apathetic, you are someone who is not seeking God. You do not seek out the things that you do not care about. Uh, there are places where when you go to those places, you go just because you have to, not because you want to. Uh, I thought of uh, in youth ministry days, we did a water park thing, and I despised going to that thing because I'm not a water park guy. It was a lock-in at a water park. was even worse, so it's in the middle of the night at the water park. I was not excited about being there. There were kids within our youth group who thought it was the best day ever, and they could not wait to get there, and you would find people that weren't involved in anything else. They wanted to be there for that thing. They were seeking that out. If you care about something, you seek it out. So if we are apathetic... We are people who are not seeking God in the way that we should. In Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. And when you think of the progression in Romans, if you kind of remember some of what's written there, in chapter 1, they are people who have given up what they knew to be truth of God for a lie, and they have replaced God with something else, and there's this long list of sins that they've gotten involved in. And in chapter 2, we learn about how they have no excuse for what they've done because they should have known better. What was, what was known about God in chapter 1 was obvious to them, and we see that play out in chapter 2. And then we get to chapter 3, and we're leading to the point where everyone has sinned and fallen short. And here in the midst of it, part of what leads them to that point where everyone has sinned and fallen short is no one is seeking God anymore. No one is looking earnestly for God. And the place we find him is in the words of Scripture. Third, uh, Apathy in the life of a Christian would be not hearing or reading his word. It is that letter that just doesn't mean a whole lot to us because we're not interacting with it regularly. In Psalm chapter 81, verses 11 and 12, he says, But my people did not listen to my voice. Israel would not submit to me. And he's describing everything they did in coming out of Egypt and out of slavery. And yet as he tried to lead them, they had something else in mind. And isn't it interesting that we read it from afar? And we see them talk about how much better things were in Egypt when they were slaves and they had no freedom. And that's how they saw it and how ridiculous that sounds to us as we're looking back at it. In the midst of it, because they're not seeking out God, because they're not in tune with his word, they miss who he is. They miss what he's doing. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. And this is something, unfortunately, that has repeated and repeated and repeated from the days of Israel coming out of Egypt. 
And we see that still today. How many people know better and know what the Word of God says and yet do not want to hear it or read it or see it, and God just gives them over to the desires of their hearts? It's what Paul writes about in Romans chapter 1. We find ourselves seeking after the wrong things. Uh, Fourth, what would apathy look like in the life of a Christian? It would look like not caring about people who are in need. So there's a lot to be said there. I, I know there's people in need that frustrate you, people in need that seem uh, as just honest as they can be and desperately in need of help, other people that you wonder how they got there and you wonder what the stories are and all of those things. But at the very core of it, we should be people who care. People who care about, well, if someone is struggling, there are times where we struggle and we want people to care about us, so we need to care about others. In James chapter 2, verses 15 to 16, James says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed or lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Having a new grandbaby in the house, I see moments, or uh, sometimes at our house, we, we see moments of this where uh, his feet will be uncovered, and my wife will say, I'll, I wonder if his feet are cold. And I can't say, Everett, are your feet cold? Because he can't tell me. And I can't say, Everett, there's a blanket right there next to you. Just grab that thing, cover up, everything will be fine. We do what we can to take care of him. We try to make things better. And for some reason, we kind of grow out of that as we go and start just expecting everybody to do everything on their own, which is great and all that, but sometimes people just need help. And so are we willing to help, or are we like the one James writes about that just says, well, good luck. Good luck with that. Fifth, an apathetic Christian is going to be more likely to be disobedient. Because if you are apathetic and you are not engaged with the Word of God, you're not going to be as aware of what it is He wants and what it is He does not want. And and we see that pop up a lot of times in Scripture. We have moments, again, like that in in just regular life that are not even godly kinds of things. How many times have you noticed you've been speeding because you missed the sign and you didn't realize what the speed limit was or that it had gone down? How many times did you find out about a rule that you didn't even know existed? and then realize you've been breaking that rule all along. There's so many things like that in life, and yet when it comes to God, He's clear about all of it with us. And yet so often we don't know just because we're not engaged in His Word. In Galatians 1 and verse 6, and this is a pretty constant theme in Paul's letters. We'll look at a couple of them. Uh, But in Galatians 1, 6, things are falling apart uh, there in Galatia because there are these disagreements between the Jewish Christians and the Greek Christians about whether the old law needs to be kept, and the Greek Christians are starting to feel guilty about that and wondering what they need to do. And Paul says this, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So because they are not, they're apathetic about what it means to be Christians, they are buying into what the Jewish Christians are telling them. Or over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, He says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So don't be taken back by all of these wrong messages, and the only way you can be there is by knowing what the correct message is. We want to be people who are trained well, very aligned with the word of God, so we know how to live for him. We want to be the kind of people that are experts at some level in this. The same way you would be in whatever your career was, where people would come to you for help or assistance, or you would be the one they would call. We want to know scripture in that way. We want to be well acquainted with the word of God. Or in Psalm 119, 105, maybe the most familiar of all, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If we are apathetic, it is as if we are choosing to walk in darkness. We don't want to see what we're going to run into. We're we're just fine with all of that. And we don't want to be people that walk in darkness. Took the dog outside the other night, and it was pretty dark out. Uh, This is my apatheticness again. Uh, Our front porch light has gone out, and I keep forgetting to change it until it's like 10 o'clock at night, and then I don't want to do it then. Uh, And so I'm out with a flashlight. It's very dark, and I'm looking around. I notice my, my dog is kind of acting kind of weird, and I look to my right, and maybe 20 feet, uh, I see the eyes uh, in the flashlight, and they're, it, fortunately for me, it's deer, and they're friendly, uh, but they're just laying there in the grass, and my dog has sensed them before me. I had no clue. I, I don't want to walk outside in darkness. I, I want to know what is there and be ready for it. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Indifference, and from the definition at the beginning, 
to now, apathy looks like indifference. And we don't want to be indifferent about things of God. And this brought to me a few things to mind. And there, there are a lot of different ones we could think of. But if you think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, where this man is robbed and left for dead along the road, and two people go by, and they have reasons to not stop. And then they keep going. And then finally someone stops and helps. Those two people, we could describe them in any number of ways. But one of the primary ones, I think, would be indifference. They feel like this is not my problem. Someone else, someone else will handle this. I'm too busy. I've got a schedule to keep. I've got a place to go. And instead, the third man, the good Samaritan that comes along, is willing to stop and help. Secondly, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, where we usually emphasize the latter part of that parable, where the rich man is begging for someone to, to go back and tell his family and warn them and all of that. In the early part of the parable, we learn that the rich man had all this wealth and everything was going well, and the poor man Lazarus was sitting at his gate, and the sense that I get is the rich man is just kind of ignoring him as he's there. He's just this guy who's there and kind of in the way, and I'm not going to be bothered by him. It's indifference that's being shown by those folks with the Good Samaritan and then also with the rich man here with Lazarus. And then third, the judgment scene in Matthew 25, that one that's familiar to us where Jesus talks about, I was hungry and you fed me and I was in prison and you visited me. That is an indifference when it's the flip side of I was in those things and you did nothing. There was an indifference that was shown. Or in his own life, you also see the example of his apostles who are there waiting, keeping watch while he's praying, and each time as he comes back, they're asleep. And he tells them, couldn't, couldn't you stay awake for an hour? It's indifference. And for most of us, if we are honest with ourselves, we have had moments of that, where something was very important to someone else and we wanted to help them with it or be supportive of it, but somewhere along the way, it just wasn't quite as important to us. And so we didn't, or we let them down. When it comes to God and his word, we don't want to be people who are indifferent about it. We want to be people who show care and not apathy towards it. And then lastly, uh, lukewarmness. And this always draws us, I think probably most of you, when you hear the, the phrase right off, you think of the letters to the churches in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 3, it says, to the, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you either were either cold or hot. You ever have those times where you're just kind of there? You're, you're not really, you don't hate whatever it is. You don't love whatever it is. You're just kind of there. Uh, this shows itself in our world too often with, where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? Or what do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want to eat? And it's this back and forth. We just, we're just kind of apathetic about it. So the church in Laodicea, they're neither cold nor hot. They're just kind of present. In verse 16, it says, So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And if you have had that, that drink that you feel like is supposed to be a hot thing or a cold thing and it's the other, it's just, it just doesn't feel right. It's not the right thing. So I, he spits you out of his mouth. In verse 19, skipping down, he says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. So what I see the, the, the vision here of this church and the letter to this church doing is it moves people from inaction to action, from just being kind of lukewarm to doing something. And so as he shows kind of the other side of this here in verse 19 and, and moving on, there are things that people are to do. So first of all, be zealous. And we don't use zealous a lot nowadays, but this is basically care about whatever it is and go with it full force. So we are concerned enough about things of God that they are a priority to us. And then repent. Don't be content with the way it has been. Do something different. In verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door. So it's not enough that he's knocking. It's not enough to have heard his voice. You have to react to that now. And so you open the door. I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. So there is this fellowship that takes place because you have taken the steps of opening the door. And then in verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. 
So this one is now conquering, and there was a reward involved. And I hope you notice, as we went through these three verses here, 19 through 21, the progression. There is a, an acknowledging of what it was and changing to a different path in changing attitude, in being zealous. So all of this is kind of within kind of stuff. And then in verse 20, it's an opening the door. You are now welcoming something different than what it has been. And then in verse 21, conquering. You are now taking action and winning, and there is a reward that comes with that. I believe for us, that's the journey away from apathy. It's If you have been content with lukewarmness or apathy, to be able to go to a place where your mindset changes and you repent of that, and then to welcome God into your life in a different kind of way where he is more the king on the throne and less just another part of life, that you will move yourself to a place where you can conquer these things and there is a reward that comes with that as a result. So action, we learn here in Revelations 3, is better than apathy. It's better than being lukewarm. It's better than not caring. And if we are people who are taking action when it comes to Scripture, it is all the things we talked about this morning. It is recognizing that if I am not involved in Scripture, studying Scripture, reading Scripture now, I need to begin to take steps to change that. I, I need to be a person who is not content to know that the letter from God is in that stack of other things or, or in one of these collecting dust on a shelf somewhere. But instead, this letter from God is something I'm going to bring into my heart that is there in the times when I need it, that is there to make me learn more about him and learn more about me and more about his church and more about what he wants us to do in his world. There is no better way to get into contact with that message than right here. So tonight, if you're apathetic in any way, you are probably not alone. I, I don't say that to pacify you. I, I say that to hope you realize maybe there's some guilt that comes with that, but I hope you realize there are, there are a lot of apathetic Christians out there. But you can change that tonight. Don't be content with being there. Take action to do something different. If you have never followed him, you can be baptized into him, and it's probably a little bit up and down on the road from here. There are times where things are going incredibly smoothly, times where things are difficult, but you do that with a church family who loves you and wants to encourage you and bring you along closer to him. You can be part of this family, you can be baptized, you can be saved, and you can live with him forever. Or if you have done that and found yourself apathetic about your walk with God, you can come back tonight. You can be the child he wants you to be, and you can have the reward that comes with that. If there's some way we can help you tonight, please come while we stand and sing.